<laughs> Hello and welcome to season three, episode 10 of The Dive. I am Kobe, joined by Azale and Mark Z here. Today, we officially wrap up Spring Split, gentlemen. It is time for playoffs. And you know what that means, Azale. It means we get to see how boosted we were with our power rankings at the start <laughs> of the true. year. Uh, it's going to be a banger. Let's uh, let's get into it. So we have our aggregated power rankings, and we know it's going to be you know 3D AR power rankings, so like flying over our heads and, and stuff. <laughs> just so cover me because I wasn't can... included in the <laughs> aggregate. So just right here is where the graphics should live. Okay, exactly. It's going to be very very advanced when you guys are watching this. But all right, so the aggregated power rankings that we had. This was with Jat back at the start of the split. Uh -huh. Rest in peace, Jat. Uh, we had TL number one, C9 number two, Hundred Thieves third, TSM fourth. Golden Guardians fifth, Echo, uh, rather Clutch was sixth, and then we had a tie in seventh for CLG and Echo Fox, mm -hmm. FlyQuest ninth, and Optic tenth. Uh, and where obviously things did end was Liquid one, C9 two, TSM three, FlyQuest four, Golden Guardians five, Echo Fox six, CLG Optic tied for seventh, ninth is Clutch, and tenth is 100 Thieves. Let's start at the top. All right, well, first we? off, let's let's talk about what goes into grading a power ranking. Okay. Yeah. Because for me, I think it's hard to get rankings a hundred percent right. So I say, hear me out. Yeah. If you're within, if you're within one spot of where you put them, that's pretty good. <laughs> I think, I think honestly, even even within like like two spots, right? Like that's pretty, that's pretty close. I think having having a general like test of their power or whatever, uh, you know, does does have it pretty accurate. Like I, I don't think it's really much a difference between third and fourth, fifth and sixth. Kobe, settle five. settle it. Are you within one or within two? I just look at how where they are placed, where they actually were, and how far you are off, right? So Hundred Thieves, for example. Yeah. Is, Hundred all Thieves of us is the universal troll. Is is of course like that's the hardest one to predict. No one got it right. However, I Got closest by putting them fourth. Wow! Instead of third, like all of you guys did. That's such a. It's so weird to be like, how far off from being horribly wrong were you? <laughs> I was only ninety five percent off. Hear me out. Hundred percent. <laughs> hear me out though. You did flame me and question me for how could I put them? Uh, how what? could I put TSM above one hundred thieves? I did not. You did. You said. He's making this up. What? Check the tapes. He goes, how can you put TSM above 100 Thieves when they this added so long ago. two rookies? And uh, we'll yeah, I, w <laughs> I remember it clearly because everyone was flaming me for not putting 100 Thieves higher. Uh, how could I put TSM above them when they added two rookies and, and 100 Thieves added a world champion? This is blasphemy. Well, Azale. I don't believe it. In the present world that we live in. But you still thought they were going to be the fourth best team. It's like it's yeah. like splitting hairs of how like no one could have seen how bad Hundred Thieves was. Very yeah. true. Yeah. Whereas I mean, on the flip side, uh -huh. I knew Clutch Gaming was not going to be very good in my room. You had them in tenth. Yeah, I had them in tenth. They finished ninth. You guys had them as a playoff team. Yep. Well, I had them. I had them in seventh. So so to sing my own praises, I got five of the six playoff teams right. Hundred Thieves was the one I got wrong. I had TLC nine as top two, and then I had TSM Golden Guardians Echo Fox in there. So pretty happy with with where I predicted most of the teams. Uh, 100 Thieves, I was way off. FlyQuest, I was also way off. Mm -hmm. I thought FlyQuest was going to be the worst team in the league because I didn't have a lot of faith in Viper. Uh, I thought that him coming into the league, that a lot of the top laners, he wasn't going to be able to actually match up with. And it's it's kind of ironic because now we see Huni and Someday and guys like that that, you know, I had thought of as some of these premier top laners, not even in playoffs. Viper showed that not only can he compete with these guys, but he, you know, he can actually beat a lot of those top level players. So, you know, that was one of the things that, you know, that's my only kind of saving grace for when we talked about FlyQuest. I put them at the bottom based on the fact that I thought Viper was not going to be LCS caliber. I, I didn't think that he was going to be able to match up. And I remember when we were talking about it saying mm -hmm. you know, that he would have to really be able to step up for them to actually, you know, make a run at it. And he did. And I was very wrong about that. And FlyQuest, I think, has has really far exceeded my expectations. Um, but I got the other five playoff teams right. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Yeah, I had FlyQuest at seventh. I was the highest one for FlyQuest. I feel like you guys dragged me down. <laughs> I have FlyQuest seven too, yeah. <laughs> and, we knew. Uh, and pulled I us know. back. But what we should really Still, turn our eyes yeah. towards is Jat's rankings. <laughs> yes, let's blame him. <laughs> if now we, that he can't defend him. <laughs> if, we, if we go by Azale's um, style of like the playoff teams, he put 
Golden Guardians, FlyQuest, and Fox all um, out of playoffs. So I don't like that. What was he thinking? I don't like going by playoffs because I got two of them wrong. <laughs> yeah, I don't. So I don't. I don't, I don't really, see, you both got two of them wrong. So I like really, it being I, the superior. That's why I like the, the one thing away because I had CLG six, but they tied for seventh. <laughs> and I had Optic eighth, and they were for seventh. We eight. can also flame Kobe because he had Echo Fox eight. I, Who would have thought? I had, yeah. so I got, That's two spots off. I got Echo Fox pretty wrong. I had Echo <laughs> Fox ninth. I had the hundred thieves wrong, obviously, and I had FlyQuest wrong as my yeah. three big wrongs. But everything else was within one, I think, yeah. of their spot. And I, I mean, the tr the truth is, like having having FlyQuest at like seventh versus sixth and things like that. Like I I, I don't yeah. really think is is that big of a difference because really it was like everyone saw that TL and C9 were going to be the top two teams pretty much, right? Like I know there were some uh, power rankings and media power rankings that had hundred thieves as number one. Tyler, and, um, yeah, ESPN <laughs> did that, and and I, but I, I also saw some other people, individual analysts that had them, you know, up at the very top. Uh, but for the most part. Everyone thought TLC9 was going to be at the top. They are. You know, that that was was pretty easy to predict. And there's, you know, another grouping of teams. Like, we saw, like, talking about the clump throughout the split for so, so much of the year. There was, like, six teams that, you know, you could see them winning one more, losing one more, and, and you know, reaching that kind of fifth, sixth spot. Yeah, a couple of them, like Echo Fox, looked like the ninth place team for a while and yep. then went on some crazy run where they beat multiple playoff teams to get in. Mm -hmm. yep. So, like... It was super close the whole way through. Yeah. I'm pretty happy that we were very good with Golden Guardians because I feel like that was one of the more difficult ones to predict also. Mm -hmm. uh, we kind of slapped them right in there around the middle and fifth. I was panicked after which, week two when there was 0-4. I was like, we yeah. messed up. We overhyped them. <laughs> exactly. Um, it was, it was, that was definitely one that uh, had a lot of variability yeah. to it. Um, Golden but Guardians ended up panning out pretty well. Golden Guardians was funny because I remember. So I, I was getting when when they were talking about doing the LCS stock game before the start of the year. So I didn't actually like buy stocks, but they were kind of at, getting different people's opinions on how it would work. And I was like, well, it's not going to be that interesting because I think if you really want to like try hard it, you just buy the like, all the stocks of whatever team you think is like too far down compared to where you feel they'll end. And so I I had thought you know Golden Guardians gonna be fifth, and they were ranked like ninth or tenth or whatever. So uh, I was saying, I'll just buy as many Golden Guardian stocks as I could have. And then I remember uh, after, the, after the second week, everyone was like, well, you would have been a dumbass if you did that. And they went 0-4. And I was like, woo. So I'm not saying I wouldn't have sold all my stocks there had I done it. But uh, Chloe, our, our head stats analyst, uh, told me that after at the end of the split, had I actually just done that strategy, I would have been first place. I well, if you held, yeah, but it's hard to hold. I, well, I I would I never doubt myself. So. You just said you would have sold. I, <laughs> I I did that exact thing. I bought like four or five. Have sold hundred <laughs> percent. I bought four or five Golden Guardian stock for the first week for that exact reason. They looked yeah. really undervalued. Yeah. Then they went zero four, and I was like, oh my god, I sold it. I was like, this is a horrible team. This is why you just gotta trust. I don't ask Mark. You I, know? I think I would, didn't buy Golden Guardian stock the whole rest of the season. I was so burned you by them. Just, I you were just like just horribly scarred. I spent the whole rest of the stock market trying to make up that deficit from yeah. that yeah. bad purchase i think freak actually ended up winning nope out of uh out of people he was there's not no shown there's no public record of that yeah but someone have to leak slack logs for that to happen and we're all right is, is a, it's buckled up tight yeah. never has leaked anything before <laughs> <laughs> so definitely not good oh that my leak. goodness get me out of here <laughs> What about MVP awards, huh? <laughs> Whoa, okay. Smooth transition. <laughs> um, uh, the, yeah, power rankings are fun and all, but it's mostly just us gloating <laughs> over here. Well, uh, and, I mean, I think it's also fun to talk about why, like, what what do you guys think? I, I'm interested to actually hear before we move on. Why is it we were so wrong about some of them, right? You know, so what went so wrong with, with 100 Thieves? Let's pin them and let's pin FlyQuest as the two biggest outliers for most people's power rankings. Why was 100 Thieves so much worse than people thought? And why was FlyQuest people, so much better? Everyone has been trying to figure out figure out why 100 Thieves are so much worse. The whole split is there. Mm -hmm. uh, and no one has come up with the correct answer. Give me your there. two cents. Um, there, there, is, there is no rhyme or reason. You can't examine it from the outside. I, I'm convinced you have to be on the inside. You have to be in those scrims. You have to understand what the coaching staff is doing. Because no matter how you look at it on paper... They should not be the tenth place team. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other thing too is they actually only got one win. They were like one in, oh my god, like one in twelve or something in the back yeah, half yeah. of the split. And then they were they were at one point they were three and three. It just yeah. looked like so, the morale was completely shot so, for the whole team. Yeah, I, th I think they like imploded. This wasn't like a 
just based off how it started kind of close and then they just nosedived, it does feel like a... But that's that's your reasoning, right? Like, And that's fine reasoning to give. Sure, yeah, because I don't think from a talent perspective, like maybe people over-focused on... I think this happens a lot when new rosters get put together, not just in esports, but around the world and every sport is like you look at like what the peak potential could be and you yeah. hype that up and you don't focus on like the negatives, which is I think what happened with Clutch for a lot of people is like, look at all these great one-time players. If they all return to form, they'll be a great team. And it's like, well, none of them return to form yeah and i think that's kind of what happened here where it's like who he was trending down uh onda was not really a great replacement for medios bang for cody son looks like an upgrade but like how does bang actually work with the team and afro's trending down and you just assume those trends are going to reverse and then they don't but even if you did were like super pessimistic no one would put them 10. yeah and one of the biggest things for uh putting together teams when you know and in a season where so many rosters did change how are people going to work together on mm -hmm. a personal level is one of the biggest factors mm -hmm. and that's only something you can guess at yeah so it, it those types of things are super difficult without having extra access inside the team I, I think it's i think it's a really interesting conversation and i've talked with some people about this and you know i, I had a tweet the other day just talking about like this year to me felt like for LEC and for LCS, yes, there are still very successful imports, but it felt like some of the biggest name imports had had failed, right? You know, when you have Bang and Someday on the last place team in, in, in NA, that feels really weird. Gorilla going to LEC and not making playoffs on the team that people had huge expectations for there. You know, Crown and Arrow missing playoffs, you know, uh, a lot, Ignar, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, lots of, of kind of big imports did not have success. Trick went to Galacticos, didn't even end up keeping his spot so on and so forth. So it felt like this is the maybe the first year where there were not, I shouldn't say the first year, but this was the year where I felt more than any other in the past, we have seen kind of some of these Korean imports not have as much success. And it feels like it's no longer guaranteed that you just get these amazing individual players and your team just gets all these wins. The strength of the league has gone up in general. And I also think that the game is shifting more and more towards importance of team play. And I think as a result, communication becomes paramount and sometimes there's going to be difficulties i think like when you're when you're bringing in a korean player and if they're not working as well with the team if the team cannot communicate as well like that can be more problematic so it's it's not just about getting the most talented korean player now it feels like it's about getting people who can communicate well together having a really cohesive system and when that falls apart i mean as you guys said 100 thieves there's no way that when you look at the individual talent of these players that they should be 10th but they are because well mental boom perhaps but also they never really worked together as a unit. And we even saw interviews with with like who he talking about that, that he never felt like they had played as a team and you know, other players being pretty vocal about that as well. So it's it is kind of interesting that there's more and more, I feel like, of a paradigm shift towards European imports and European imports because it's the same language and uh well, primarily, right? Yeah. And also like just it's it's an easier transition even culturally. Uh, to go from Europe to to uh, America, I think, versus Korea to America. Yeah, I know you brought up that same thing last time and we're talking about it. Um, I, I still feel the same way as we kind of discussed it last time. Like there, there, is, there is a factor of that. There is also a factor of there are much more Korean imports going out now. A lot of mm -hmm. them are older players and a lot of our kind of judgments and values of players from year to year um, it, it is harder, not just for uh, imported players to stay at the at, at a high level year over year, but, um, you know, even people who have had uh, success in their own leagues, right? Mm -hmm. If you look inside Korea, um, all these new younger players outdoing all the older players has yeah. nothing to do with imports. That's all within Korea, same language, same everything, um, you know, and we have the the rise of all of these kind of young players, so... I think there are like a decent amount of kind of confounding factors, but uh, I do agree with the general thread of especially now like, you know, communication for the team acting as a whole and everyone, even not just like literally talking about a play beforehand, but within practice and within scrims, like everyone getting on the same page as far as how they want to play the game. Um, uh, every little bit uh, does help as far as having a cohesive team environment. And I think FlyQuest is the reciprocal of that like problem with 100 Thieves where we're all like, they're so much mm -hmm. better than everyone thought. And it's like, yeah. I, I forget who I was talking to. I think it was LocoDoco who was like, who on this team is going to be a problem? Like, and the answer is none of them. They're all like super chill, very easy to get along with guys. So like they're going to have one of the easier times working together, even if they 
don't have like the star power that everyone wants. Uh, and so I think they're kind of the evidence as well that like teamwork is the most important thing because this team finished fourth when no one thought they could. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think it is really interesting to see that. And I think another example of that is kind of Golden Guardians. And Ole has, has talked a bit about like how he feels like everyone on the team is just like good friends and they all get along so well. And it's, it's almost like the old CLG story, right? Where, but that stuff (laughs) does actually matter a lot, I think. And it's easier to have good teamwork to understand people's perspectives and point of views. When you get along, you're less likely to get frustrated or to, you know, to kind of like think, ah, that's not really it. You know, you're going to give your friend the benefit of the doubt more than you are someone that you're kind of frustrated with or, or kind of having a lot of internal issues with. Yeah. Personal relationships are incredibly important. I think still to this day, a a lot of people underestimate how difficult of a job and how much of a commitment so being a professional player is. Um, like the the time commitment is insane, and if you're with the same people for this entire grind uh, of the season, and even with franchising, there's more pressure put on uh, by these big organizations that are you know backing all these teams with so much money. Uh, like if you don't have a good relationship with someone that you're working with that closely for that long, it's going to be more difficult to, uh, you know, have good practice and, you know, pick up the new things as they're coming along, adjust the patches, all that type of stuff. I think it's it's really interesting. I know I've talked, I think, with you and some of the casters about this. I don't know if I ever said anything about it on the dive, but like. So I, I was a WoW pro for, for many years, had a super successful no. career. And it, and it was like it was one of those things, though, where it's like so I got to choose who I played with. Right. And mm-hmm. that was something that I thought about so much when I started watching league and and, and playing league and, and casting league was like, oh, my God, these guys just get slapped with these random teammates. You don't choose what team you're going to. It's based on the on the amount of money your team has, the the decisions that are made by GMs and coaches and, and things. Sometimes a star player might have input. But for me, I literally got to decide my roster. I was just like, hey, Alex, head of EG, I want Kobe and I want Mark. And they're like, OK. And then they they go. We're in. I think, uh, they go the highest arena. battleground was like out or something. <laughs> they hit you guys up, and then I was playing with my friends, even though I was choosing my teammates and playing with some of the people who I still to this day consider some of my best friends. It was still a struggle at times. Yeah. We would still get pissed at each other. We were still frustrated as hell. And when I try to put it into perspective, like who were the players that I actually disliked the most or or disagreed with the most in the pro scene? And when I try to think, how would I have done? if that guy got slapped on my team. Yeah. And when I'm honest about myself, I don't think I ever would have won a single event. I would not have had a good career. Like I'm like, could I have done the same thing with this random person that I, that I absolutely didn't like, that we hated each other? I don't think I could. So like when I put that into perspective, I'm like, holy crap, that's actually so much harder when you don't have control of the people that you're playing with. Because mm-hmm. you, it really does become your whole life. When you talk about uh, how hard it is for pro players if you're not getting along, like you're living with these people, you are talking to these people 24 seven, it's your job, it's your personal life, they hang out together, they go to dinner together. It's literally your entire fucking universe. Yeah. And if you do not like those people, if it is constant like frustration, it just builds and it builds and it builds and it builds. Yeah, social skills are incredibly, an incredibly important part of a social game like this, right? Mm-hmm. It's a competitive game. Uh, this isn't kind. This wasn't kind of planned for us, but there was uh, also, a recent topic here that I think fits really well, since this is an interesting discussion of Tarzan, who is a famous. Um, mm. How do we put this? Uh, Player. I, yeah, I guess toxic is the Jungler. general, very overused uh, term. Not in but- the case. He is a skilled player who does not work well with with others uh, with the with the teams that he has tried. Right, he has uh, been on a couple um, academy teams as well as. Um, you know, some other um, endeavors that they tried to get off the ground. He went to Korea. Like, he got, what was it, top 50 in like a week from Diamond 4 to top 50 challenger in Korea in in one week, you know, playing Faker, playing Apto, um, beating these guys. Like, like you're saying, like, there can be scouting and you find a player and you're like, oh, my God, look at this talent, right? Mm-hmm. And you slap it uh, on a team. But if you can't, if they can't work together, then, um, you know, that's not going to pay off, right? Yeah, I think there's been a number of people over history and time that have, like, had to fix their social skills or how they present themselves to team environments to actually be successful. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's usually takes time for a lot of those guys. 
Uh, like even like Jensen or somebody like, mm-hmm. I mean, that was more riot enforced than like team enforced. But those kinds of stories about people who are super hard to work with. Doublelift, actually, there's a good one. Like didn't win for a really long period of time, won once and then had to get booted from CLG. And people say he's like not 100% reformed <laughs> from what I hear. But like he's better than what he was back in the day when he was learning from Chouster <laughs> and St. Vicious as, as like his team leaders. <laughs> I mean, it takes time to mature, right? A lot of these guys are starting at, at 17, 16, yeah. you know, in these environments. And one of the things I think that is very different about esports compared to traditional sports, at least as how it's been for most of the time, is that so if I'm going to make it to the NBA, right? Mm-hmm. I probably play some little league organizational thing. Then, I, you know, I'm in my elementary school. I play there. Then I'm high school. I play there. And then I go to university ball. I play there, right? And you have had the coaching structure and the feedback kind of circuit going through and often you're going to be in league camps and and those guys are giving you feedback and telling you how to improve and you have to work with others like this is forced upon you the whole way so when you get to nba yes it's obviously gonna be a big change but you are used to the structure you're used to the authority figures whereas if i'm gonna make it to pro i'm sitting in my bedroom and i'm playing like wow in the dark at 4 a.m by myself right and it's like for for league i think it's even more extreme than it was for for wow because in wow i had to still queue with people right and you had to get used to that in league i could play solo queue by myself and if i was super nuts i just get rank one challenger by myself great i own but i'm like sitting there raging i'm playing by myself i never work with anyone no one's giving me feedback no one's coaching me Mm -hmm. and then you're slapped in this pro environment where all of a sudden you have to listen to all these other people and what they're telling you to do and how to change your play you're like well that's not how i got good like I only listen to myself. I know best. Why would why would I listen to what Kobe says? Kobe's just a coach. He's just some scrub. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't listen to Kobe. Yeah, exactly. It does kind of bring up other uh, you know topics. People always talk about like the environment within specific teams. Even even us when we were doing our power rankings at the beginning of the year, I remember um uh part of one of my reasons i gave for golden guardians was like we were at the offline tv party and like the entire team was there partying together and like talking about how great it was energy exactly to be on a team with these guys and they were they all you could see that they liked each other and like small insights like that uh, I might have to do some different uh, research for my power rankings in the future now. You know, I have to go like. Where are you guys going hang to out party all- preseason? They'll be yeah. in the bushes when they're at the park. He's like, they're getting along and they're throwing the ball to each other. <laughs> Only three of them went out for Rama tonight. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't oh, die. oh, no. Investigative journalist Kobe <laughs> said to come to the countdown. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the, all those types of factors, right, could could lead to, you know, more accurate evaluations of teams, power rankings and stuff. Um It'd be cool to like, you know, get insight into team practices and stuff as well, uh, if we can ever get to that point. But on to the awards. Let's do it. Because we have to also vote on MVP award, also the all LCS team for each role. Like, Have you guys submitted your... No. I have not done mine yet. But I thought about it a little bit and there's not... <laughs> he thought about his homework. There's not too many surprising ones to me. So for me, a lot of the positions did come from mainly the top teams, right? There's not a whole bunch of surprise factors. Some of the surprise ones, I was like, okay, like Crown as an individual is a bottom team. I think is a good player. He could be on one of the top three for mid. Um, But then you think about who he's going to push out, and it does become kind of difficult. I also thought about Jungle Santorin. He's not on one of the top three teams, but I could see him taking a top three spot. He's been super good. Uh, what about you guys? Any kind of like outliers that you would put in there? Because if you go down a lot of the lists, people are going to say, oh, yeah, it's that jungler from uh, TL and TSM and C9, right? For most roles, uh, our top three teams, because there is such a separation, do come from there. So for me, the interesting discussion is around which are the ones that are coming from not TL sure. or TSM. I kind of agree that there's not too many that come out from other places. I think one for me would probably be Hanser for Golden Guardians. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I was think gonna say top lane, right? Yeah, because top lane feels a little weak potentially. Um, yeah, you got Licorice, and then who? And then like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of people I think mid season had impact as their number two, pretty clear cut because uh-huh. there weren't that many people challenging him. Yeah, and it's still kind of true. There's not that many people challenging him, but he has had more struggles in the second half of the split. And so, like, this kind of combos into something else I was thinking a lot about was, like, the recency bias people always talk about. 
Um, and it's especially weird for TL kind of tanking at the very end when they had a lock on so many of those number one, number two positions. And like, do they start losing some of them? Mm -hmm. I wasn't, I wasn't quite sure when I was thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, for me, the other ones for top one Viper as well, even though he's so young, um, he's been very good. I feel like, but I, I'm also kind of judging it with, this is his freshman year in the LCS. Even without that though, he might be able to squeak in a spot. I feel like it's pretty hard. It's it's so it definitely is because like you're saying, with, even with impact having the bad Jace games and uh, you know a lot of I, getting solo killed and stuff, he's he's still it's difficult to knock him down too far. It's, I mean, it's interesting because like I, I think I think he's still certainly like a really solid top laner, but I but I think about so many of the games and and I'm kind of looking at it through the point of view of if impact was on a different team with the same level of performance, you know. I don't think he would get as much of a pass as he does sometimes because, you know, in, in the Jace game against uh, CLG where he gets solo killed by Orm, but, you know, the whole rest of the map is winning, so eventually he's getting split for pressure mm -hmm. and he's taking down turrets and he's doing all these things. If your team is worse, you don't get to have that bad laning phase on a carry and then and then just kind of come back later, right? Because your your team isn't necessarily going to be winning everywhere else. And, like, I, I'm not sure if he, he should get a, a pass as much. Like, should he even be top three? I think that's yeah, hard who's, to say. Yeah, who's going to bump him down, though? Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, it's, it becomes an interesting discussion because what do you place more value on? So, like, somebody has had some really good individual performance, but he couldn't close games. But he's, his team is a disaster. So, it's like, should he be in yeah. there? You know, I think Hanser has had a, a quite a good season. I think Licorice is in there for sure. Well, Licorice, for me, I feel like Licorice is, is pretty still much guaranteed, I think. 100% number one. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't but even I, think... But I think Hanser and Viper, I could see an argument for certainly. <clears throat> uh, I think that those guys are, are somewhat deserving of, of consideration. What about Broken Blade? I, I haven't Broken heard Blade anyone mention well. Broken Blade. And as far as the recency thing, I feel like Broken Blade had an upward curve. Yes. And his, and his mistakes, I think, were less egregious than Impact's, to be honest. And since we have been just considering so much about team play and morale and how you work with the team... Uh, I've been watching a lot of the team videos and documentaries and, and stuff that each of them are doing. And Broken Blade is one of the best things, I think, for that team atmosphere because a lot of the other iterations of TSM have kind of had, to me, like a dark cloud of uh, very strict atmosphere. Yeah. Like if, if they ever lose games, it gets so stressful. Um, but like watching the episodes with him, I'm laughing sometimes out loud, and like right. that does not. He seems like the heart of the he, team almost. He, it's kind of yeah. He's actually a hilarious uh, person, so it, it feels like to your point earlier about who would you choose to have on your team. Like I feel like you would have fun at the very least. <laughs> well, and, and even even from the get go, I remember seeing like mic checks and some of the listen ins where we get the comms yeah. in the early weeks. He's giving kind of these. Like it was almost pseudo jokey, but he's given kind of like the the pep talks for the team before the game starts. But it became like it becomes like this thing where it almost seemed like it started a little bit as a joke, but it seems pretty serious to me. Mm -hmm. And and he actually does seem like somewhat of a an, like a motivational figure on the team, which is kind of cool to see from a guy coming in who's you know he's on a team with with Bjergsen and Sven and these guys who are such veterans that you would certainly expect them to be the ones kind of giving those talks. And he does seem like a good guy to have on the team and, and a good atmosphere. You're not a fan. What are you, what are you guys yeah, doing? Yeah, did Using play, like <laughs> using team content as like maybe we should put him higher. Come on, on the rift stuff. <laughs> we don't know what's going on with all the other teams necessarily. So we, we got to do our do scouting, you Mark. Your, we got to get in the bushes. I think, top lanes. Yeah. So on the topic of impact versus broken blade and all this stuff, I feel like if you tunnel on impact's laning phase and some of the mistakes he makes, like yes, it looks mm -hmm. bad sometimes. But he also has a number of game winning fights. This team fighting is really good. Like there's a couple fights where he was on Scion. He like alts in out of nowhere, hits key targets, and sets up like the entire fight for his team. And like some of the laning phases on carries, it's like yeah, his team brought him there. But like he also brought his team back from being down two to three k mm -hmm. time and time again, especially early in the season. And so that's like where the recency bias thing matters to me because. He doesn't get help. He has the second lowest jungle proximity in the league behind Dokla. Uh, he, I feel like, I don't know if it's his fault or not, but like the draft feels like it always puts him in weird spots. Maybe it's because Jensen and, and Double F have higher priority or whatever. I don't know. Um, and then like even his carry games, like he does some stupid stuff like dying in lane. Maybe that you couldn't do that on another team, but he's not on another team. And so like he still plays the game out pretty well from there. So I, I have a hard time bu bumping him down. Uh, I think it's become a lot closer than it was in the middle of the split. But like, mm -hmm. if we want to go like, impacts a great guy off off the rift apparently too. He's like super jovial, His, easy to talk up to about the game and stuff like that. So like, 
I have a hard time one incorporating off the off the game stuff from like. So that's not included into my into my voting. It's just more became a okay, tangential okay, conversation. Okay. I'm not saying Apollo is nicer, so he's going to be my number <laughs> it's one. It's so much easier <laughs> to work with him. Than just, double lift. I think I think Broken Blade has actually had a really good split, and I'm not even trying to say that Impact isn't going to be in my top three. I haven't actually made my final decisions, but I'm but I am saying at the start of the year, I I would have not really foreseen a world in which he wasn't guaranteed in the top three. And now I actually do see a world in which there's a conversation that, hey, maybe Broken Blade or Viper or Haunter or someone is actually bumping him out. Yeah, I think top lane is is actually one, the of, the, one of the most interesting. There's definitely some variability there. What about mid lane? Because that has always been a hot topic. You know, the most powerful lane, middle of the map. We got star players, Bjergsen, Jensen, Niski. What about Poe Belter squeaking? Like, you know, who who's actually making moves? Because for me, I I threw out Crown really mm -hmm. early because his individual play, I have really enjoyed watching Crown um, in North America. You know, he's been roaming a lot. He's been playing all these different champions. Um, I think that he definitely could be one of the stories where even though the team is not super highly rated, I feel like he at his position has been very good. Uh, I don't see him, you know, like topping the chart or anything, but it could be one of those. What about Phoenix and Froggen? Sneak into that. That's what I was saying. Phoenix has definitely been good as well as Froggen. Yeah, it's it's such a stacked position right now. It feels like uh, that I think the top is also stacked. So like it, it's super <laughs> because it's so tight. It's yeah. so hard to differentiate yourself from the rest of the people who have been playing well. And I think without spoiling all the votes like i think the top three teams have very very good mid laners who work with their teams exceptionally well yeah mm -hmm. and i have a hard time displacing any of them i know that some people have definitely been criticizing jensen recently when team liquid you know started dropping a bunch of games um but i still feel like he's such a a good player maybe you can throw things like oh he hasn't been taking as many risks as yeah you know some situation maybe he actually could have done something in this game even when team liquid had you know x problems going on it's really funny because it the jensen conversation this year is so reminiscent to me of the bjergsen conversation last year mm -hmm. where everyone was saying yeah that bjergsen guy kind of sucks <laughs> now like he's always winning in his lane yeah you're like what well, but <laughs> but he could have maybe 1v5 right yeah and it feels yeah. like that's kind of the the jensen conversation now and with jensen it's interesting because it does feel like at least from the eye test, it feels like there has been a paradigm shift. Like the way that he's playing does feel different. It did feel that last year he was playing more aggressively, taking more risks, like going for, for soul kills, going for these big plays. And I don't know if that's that he just is, is on a team that he has so much faith in now that he's he's playing more risk averse, or maybe that's a coaching thing, or maybe it's just a play style thing. I don't know. But it does from the eye test feel that he is playing somewhat less aggressively and, and kind of like riding that line a little bit less than he has in the past but that being said he's still been fantastic and it's like you know i saw criticisms of uh him in on the oriana game oh. against tsm but like i'm like it, he it felt like he was one of the only people doing well on his team yeah. and he was at a really strong point and he couldn't get the shockwave and people were criticizing him for oh well you didn't shockwave those guys that's what's it's like they're on yeah. the nexus when they grouped yeah. up and you sure you could have shockwaved them <laughs> but your team got slammed it's, and yeah. and I, I don't really fault him for that yeah I, I mean watching people criticize oriana play is one of the most frustrating things for me like f no offense to reddit analysts but like <laughs> they just i don't think you ever have to say that i'll, I'll always say it i love reddit <laughs> Okay, <laughs> but uh, yeah, just Please seeing keep over in your stuff. Yeah, okay. <laughs> don't brigade, but say thank you. Yeah, uh, <laughs> um, it's just like every game when someone loses on Oriana and there was like some team fight where they didn't find like the right shockwave, people are like, oh, this guy's just holding his alt for next year, like when they get relegated, and it's like it's so easy to sit there as a fan and watch an entire fight and then like pinpoint when would have been the optimal time. Like with hindsight, like that would have been the best time to alt, but like you're looking for the game changing because you're losing the game alt and it didn't show up. And so like I feel like I saw it with Poe, I saw it with yeah. I think Crown, I saw it with with in that game as well. Where in the post game thread, everyone's just like they should have alted at a different time and they didn't. I feel and I hate responsible them. for that because I was casting that game. And so and the thing is when you're when you're casting it. You don't want the cast to become so one-sided towards the winning team. Yeah. So you're trying to talk about, okay, well, what is the way that this that this team maybe comes back? And so I was casting that game, and I was definitely saying at times, like, not that, hey, he should have shockwave, but more to, to be like, okay, what's the way they come back? Okay, well, the way they probably come back is Jensen has his death cap. If he can hit the fatty shockwave, maybe you can get the miracle team fight. 
right? So because I because I set that up, you and stick it, the dogs on it, yeah. it, and it doesn't happen. I, no. I do feel a little bit responsible I when I saw some of those comments. Um, I don't think you need to worry about it because it happens like literally every losing know, Oriana, know, every losing Oriana game. Watch, look at the post game thread, and it's should alter the. So last it's game. it's it's a very team fight impacting giant can, AOE ultimate right, exactly. with a delay that also requires prior positioning. It's yeah. like telegraphed, it's slow. Also, and if anyone has flashes, it doesn't hit them. You know, if, if the enemy's good. Also, um, I think people really underestimate holding big CCs. Because you're talking about people like a flaming Pressure. X person for not using their big ultimate instantly. Uh, you can gain so much uh, pressure in a team fight, You're zoning, actually threatening off enemy carries by holding cooldowns. Um, yeah, you actually, a lot of the times to correctly play stuff like Evelyn is to sit back, you put the charm on the person, like they cannot go in for the entire duration of something like that while you're holding these uh, big abilities. Yeah, you put the ball down. They're trying to kill your carries. Now they can't run over the ball. Yeah, and it's yeah. like, okay, well, I didn't ult, but like maybe like I that. protected someone to get back to the fountain or something. Yeah. And so I don't know. It's a, it's a minor pet peeve that I spent way too long tangenting on. No, but I mean, I think it's, it's fair to talk about, right? And, and it is one of those things that I also think it's partly because we have seen Jensen in the past like get those crazy game-changing shockwaves. So you yeah. want to see it again when you're watching the game, right? And, and he's even one of the guys that I always felt like was one of the best, if not the best, at getting the shockwaves without getting like team assistance to set it up. He yeah. always seemed to find the one where he flashes in, he gets a big shockwave or whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, whereas sometimes you're watching other players and you're like, ooh, I don't know if they can hit it unless they have the J4 to bring it in or whatever. Uh, but either way, I mean, Jensen has been really, really dominant. One thing I wanted to kind of pose to you guys as well is Rookie of the Split, for the longest time, everyone is talking about it as as a completely locked up race for Viper. Mm -hmm. What do you think about Vulcan? Can he actually challenge Viper at all for that? Because he was on a pretty dumpster team, but when I watch him as far as the eye test, Individually, he had some very impressive mechanical plays. I think he played out a lot of a lot of fights very, very well. I think he he was really impressive individually, but there were also certainly mistakes. The team did not win a lot. They did not necessarily look super good as a bot lane combined. Does he get any consideration, or are they just uh, too bad of a team? Uh, I think he's been a very good player, and even coming in, I think he um, was one of the rookies that was decently hyped up however viper has just had actual game winning moments you know and as coming in as a top laner flyquest doing much better than a lot of people thought that they were going to do he was a big part of it he even got to embrace his unique strengths like riven mm -hmm. like 2v1 in people's back lines he has adapted over the split i feel like there are just so many positives for viper that it is still like ridiculously hard for me to move Viper off of that, uh, you know, rookie of the split award. I think Vulcan has been really good, especially for a rookie, but uh, it's pretty locked up for me. I think his his playmaking and like mechanics look really really good, mm -hmm. and the I don't know how much I love his like game sense or I, I guess laning phase type stuff. And I don't know if this is Piglet and him's like play style just being way too aggressive, but they pick a lot of fights and they lose bot lane pretty hard yeah, pretty agree. frequently because they'll take a fight and it's mechanic versus mechanic and they're really good but like they'll just take it at bad times or something and then they, they fall behind and they're they're kind of losing their team the game and i don't know if, who to put that on necessarily but on the ninth place team having those kinds of moments relatively frequently makes it really hard to upset a guy on a fourth place team who by by the way, like Viper has struggled over the course of the season too, mm -hmm. to be fair. But it's just like no one has had the highs that he has had. Yeah, and it's just no one can really. Can, it feels like for me, no one can contest him. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty much in the same boat. I, I do think as far as as far as some of the flashy plays, though, Vulcan has had some of the they've best looked ones disgusting. Yeah, of, the flash the follow and stuff. Yeah. yeah, like he has had some really nice flash follows like, where he's like. Wing in on Alistar and then predicting their flash and flashing forward and getting the cue on them. The funniest he's, thing was when that inspired really Ole's ones. play to do this. Oh, thing. No, <laughs> yeah. It was like, was it was the same yeah. day or the next day or something. Yeah. He did the same flash follow on yeah. Alistar. And then he died because he did it. <laughs> yeah, and he, and he, like, he flashed him. the wrong way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Like, a lot of those are predictions. So I always find those plays so impressive because there's lots of times where I'm watching a pro game and I'm like, mechanically, I could do a lot of this stuff or, mm -hmm. or whatever, but their decision making is way better. They understand the game way better, so they're way better. But when I watch a lot of those plays, I always think those are so 
impressive. They're so gutsy to do those because you can look so stupid and it can go so bad if you do it. The flash predictions. I saw, even though uh, 100 Thieves, you know, had, had a tragic season, Onda, I remember there was one game on J4 where he did mm-hmm. it multiple times where he pr- he flag and drag and then flash predicted where they were going to go essentially and flashed on top of where their flash was and got them with it. And those are, are really, really impressive to me because you need the mechanics to pull it off, but also you have to be willing to take that risk. I would say a tip for people that are trying to do that also, um, you, when you cast your E and then you cast your, your Q to your flag afterwards, you have time to then move your mouse where you think the person is going mm-hmm. to flash. And you don't have to use yours because there is travel time for you. At, it turns your body into a missile once your Q connects. So then once you while you're traveling, like you have this time where you can move, preemptively move your mouse. And as you're traveling, if they flash during that time, then you can do it. And you'll be able to get it with a slight reactive uh, one. So you don't have to EQ and then move your mouse from that EQ point, mm-hmm. which makes it slightly easier. But... Uh, it still does require that guessing. Yeah. And that you, it's so much potential. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're just giving this advice to everyone. It's like, I'm going to do that. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's, everyone's EQ. Plus, remember that when you do that, you don't get the damage. Like, there are yeah. actually not that many scenarios where it's super useful because you get the knockup, but you don't get your Q damage. Your lance doesn't move with you yeah. with your flash. Your Q damage goes out when you hook yeah. the flash, like yeah, when exactly. you shoot it initially. Yeah. So, the only scenarios where you need that is where you desperately need the knockup. Uh, and a lot of people do do it unnecessarily then they die with their flash also burned and stuff like that mm-hmm. and it, it can be tragic. it can be another bait uh you know similar to what happened to ole when vulcan pulled off the all-star That's play true. <laughs> unlucky things happen all right what about mvp do you guys think so everyone has talked about core jj so much uh-huh. and it has felt like he has been the clear front runner throughout the entire year but yet we are coming into end of the split tl lose three straight they you know they lose the tsm mm-hmm. again uh they're you know they're all kind of in this slump where a lot of people are now talking about, hey, is TSM the number one team going into playoffs? Is Cloud9 the number one team? There's more of a discussion. Does that at all shift where you guys kind of see that going? Do you think that there's actually a chance for for someone from these other teams to challenge for MVP and, and take that? I do think there's a chance. I would throw Licorice in there, uh, Bjergsen in there. Uh, I think there are definitely other possibilities. Core JJ still, to me, is such a strong candidate, though. It's, it's tough because... When, Cor- when when Team Liquid was doing good, Core JJ looked like a god, and he was mm-hmm. the one really carrying them, it felt like, and he racked up like four or five player of the games right away and then didn't get one the whole like second half of the split. And it didn't feel like he started throwing or being bad. It just felt like he became a non-factor in their games. And I don't know what happened to Alistar, but everyone's like, I'm just not playing Alistar anymore. It's just completely fallen out of the meta. And that's when he looked really good. He looked really good on the Rakan, and now he's playing more Tom Kench and Braum and stuff, and he hasn't been shining. Mm-hmm. That's not to say he's been bad, but he's in a support pool where there's a lot of really good supports. And whenever I do MVP stuff, I try and not just look at like, I try and look at the league as a whole and like, are there other guys who could have had his impact? And it's like, what if Zazel was on Team Liquid? Like, could he have, you know, basically done what Core JJ did? Mm -hmm. And I actually don't think it's that ridiculous of a case to make that like he could have been that good. So it makes it, Mm. you know what I'm saying? Like it's, Man, I'm just remembering so many plays. He won, he won like five player of the games, hard carried yeah. their early season, and yeah. then became a non-factor. So I think non-factor, I, I would contest you on non-factor. So I, I would agree if you're saying it didn't feel like he had like the game-changing play that, right, that right. you pinpoint at minute 17, Core JJ won TL the game, yeah. right? And boom, 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 and then player of the game. And that's kind of, I, I also feel like when I, when I am casting him, one of the things that impresses me most consistently about Core JJ is I almost never feel like, oh, what were you doing there? Never oh, mistake. Where where were you? Why weren't you beside double lift when you're playing Tom Kench? Oh, you should have been there. For, oh, you should have used your power for that. Like, he never fucks up. And I think that is so hard to do uh, over the course of a season. And I'm sure that someone can can dig up a clip where it's like, oh, he was trolling in this one. But they weren't but like game losing ones. Exactly. Like, and, and I think that even though he was playing Tom Kench, and Tom Kench is more of this uh, kind of defensive style, it often feels like less of a game changer unless you're really making great abyssal voyages and roams and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, you're you're not engaging the team fight kind of thing. Um, but I, I feel like his Tom Kench play was was so flawless for most of the time, where even if he wasn't the one necessarily winning them a game, he was he was always doing his job. He was always in the right place at the right time, using his devourer at great times. 
Um, and you can, again, it's almost like the Bjergsen conversation again last year, as we were talking about earlier, where should he have then been put in a position where if you're that good, you could make the argument maybe, oh, well, he should have been on the threshold of Alistar to turn around some of these games that they were losing. They needed more playmaking. But Tom Kench is so effective at protecting hyper carries and double lift is, is this great carry player. Jensen is this great carry player. So I think it made sense to put him on it. And it also, you know, if you're going to give up Tom Kench and then try to play a playmaker, then they have the ability to kind of deny that. So, uh, I, I still think that like he was never a non-factor. I always felt like he was a really positive force for TL. He just didn't necessarily have as many game winning plays in the second half. I don't think, yeah. I also don't think people should have the recency bias or even just tunnel on the Tom Kench. Remember he was the one who brought Alistar back in North America. Every support was crediting him for starting and playing it in scrims and he had multiple game winning engages these flanks behind enemy wards him tracking enemy vision uh has been one of the biggest things as well like mm -hmm. his vision score has been extremely high and he has also navigated like knowing where the enemy vision is uh super well so i just think that there has been so much that has been so good for him and the only way i would see him not getting it is if uh, people really tunnel on the recency bias in the last uh, few games. That being said, like the other guys I mentioned, I think there are some super strong other performers. All right. So we got a game for us here. Oh, boy. Uh, we have not really put it. Well, like I can speak for myself. I haven't put any thought into this just yet. Um, <laughs> yeah. But what is the best team you can make oh. out of players who didn't make playoffs? And this yeah. is kind of, you know, uh, we, we have this question and it's basically talking about there's so much talent in NA now and it's spread among so many of the teams. So you take these these four teams that didn't make playoffs and that is Optic, 100 Thieves, Clutch, and CLG. What is your dream team out of there? Import rules still apply. I am going to use my imports first. And my first draft pick is going to be mid lane, as is classic North America. Brown. And I'm picking Crown. You already know because I talked about him earlier in the show. I mean, you can, you can, I guess the only other question that comes down to from there, I think we're all going to take Crown, right? Well, the I think, other option I think there is an argument to would just be take POV. the 100 Thieves imports too, right? You know, it, it, but it's it's like, can you then still have a strong mid laner? Because if we're only talking out of that pool, uh, that does become pretty tough. I'm well, because touched. you can't take you, the only other one <laughs> yeah. you'd want is Poe. Yeah, you're right. He, they're yeah. all imports, so you have yeah. you have I'm, to. I'm not gonna keep anything intact crown, from then. the 100 Thieves team. <laughs> the only thing I would probably take from that team would be someday. I think. So that's that's what I was gonna say, which led to my my follow question: Is it Huni or someday? But it sounds like I would. Pick, oh, I think it's someday. I would pick someday. someday. I think Huni has just had too many um, poor games. Mm -hmm. The ar the argument is like so. So then, who's your who's your AD, right? Because there's yeah, an the argument to yeah. take Bang as well. Um, Stixie, I think in the past is a guy I would argue have argued a lot for, but Stixie has not looked as good. Arrow Arrow is an import. You know, who do you want from from Clutch? Would you go for like a Cody Sun or something like that, um, or a Piglet? You know, like you you are gonna have to sacrifice in other roles if you want to take top lane. Uh, mid, I think, does make the most. But sense. look at your other top laners. Yeah, yeah. that are not imports. It's it's really tough. Right? I mean, but between <laughs> so then you're deciding which so most important. I'm between I, AD and top. There's it, it feels like you have to take an import based on those teams. Like I think Stixa and Cody Sun are better options than. Uh, the Doklo or Darshan. I think for top. Marksman is a less independent role, so I would also take someday because I feel like if you have a really bad top laner that's going to struggle against people in the one v one, like it becomes so much harder to play the rest of the game. Whereas I don't necessarily feel that way about Marksman. And that's that's kind of the traditional wisdom has been import solo laners, yeah. right? So all right, so I, I can buy that. So we got Crown, we have someday. we have someday. Those are your imports. So you're all. Would you get six A or uh, Cody Sun for AD? Probably Stix A. I think Stix A. Uh, it's hard because we only had like one game. Yeah, left, so. and and Cody said, I mean, there's, it, it's tough. Yeah, you like last last year he was he was doing okay for sure, um, but I do think that Stix A historically has been better. Stix A, Stix A, and Biofrost haven't been great this year though. And I. It's tough. They haven't been great for I a would go while. Cody I like Sun. last year I would though, go they Cody still had really Sun. good laning phase. I would go Cody Sun. You know what I'm thinking of is Thresh. Uh, Stixay got hooked nine times in one game, lost the game. Come on, dog. 
I'm I sorry. Mean, are, that's are just what's in my head. Are we building a team that you actually need we to? We have like, to agree. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, we don't have to agree. I'm not agreeing. I, I, I'm, I'm I saying, think that I might go Cody Sutton. We, we never know exactly what happened on the 100 Thieves roster with Cody Sutton. Yeah. There's a reason no one took a chance on True. him. And there's a reason he's in Academy. And there's a reason that they didn't bump him up earlier. Like, I think that there's maybe we don't have all the details, but mm -hmm. like, if I was a team owner and you're asking me between Stixe, who like has had highs, had some lows, haven't really heard anything too bad about behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And like this guy who seems contaminated, like I would, I would be very hesitant. <laughs> oh my goodness. He's contaminated. You know, you like, oh you gotta get God. some rubber gloves to handle. I'm just saying it would be, it would be the hazmat suit. Oh, yeah. Oh, dude. He might be radioactive. <laughs> um, I would be hesitant. And I think we're both going, we're all going optic junglers, right? Mm -hmm. One of the two. Yeah. It's got, it's, I, I would go medios, I think. Uh, because again, if you're talking about contamination, <laughs> <laughs> I think that I think that Dardock, uh, Dardock, Dardock has had issues surrounding him, right? Oh no! And Dardock, I think, is a super talented player, but I think Medios performed well uh, in the split, also. And I mean, to be fair, some people that I talk about Medios like not always getting along with coaches and, and things like this, and having because he has a very, I think, specific way of how he sees the game. Uh, and how he thinks the game should be played. And if people aren't on the same page, I think that can be more difficult because he is, you know, very strongly sees the game one way, I think. Um, but I mean, I, I think you could create a pretty strong team. So if we're saying someday crown, you know, Medios uh, or Dardock, I think that that's like pretty interchangeable. Maybe that's your six man roster. Then if, if you guys want to make the argument for 6A or Cody Sun, I think I'm on the 6A side of that. Then the interesting discussion becomes support. And I think most people would say it's between Biofrost and Aphromoo. I know Aphromoo has been getting a lot of... I'm going Bio game. for sure. So you're just bringing in the CLG bot lane, even though... I'm not... Oh, I didn't so you're going Cody's son. Yeah. So that's where it becomes interesting because I think that Biofrost, you want to say individually, has been quite good. And last year, I actually think CLG's bottom lane was the shining light for their squad. They won a lot of games through there. Yeah, they won a lot of games through their last split. And they actually had some of the best laning stats last split. This split, though, they have not looked very good. So it is interesting because I do still feel like when I look at the individual pieces, I want to take them. But their bottom line has not been impressive to me. Uh, I, I still think I probably would say bio just based off off of that. But Aphromoo, Aphromoo, maybe maybe reunite Aphromoo and, and Stixie. I mean, Aphromoo still, still, I think, is a very good player. I think he's gotten a lot of heat this split. But he was the MVP last year. I still think that he is a strong veteran voice for a team. And you do want to have someone to do shot calling on the squad who is going to be that kind of reliable voice. And and for that reason, I think maybe I would bring in Aphromoo and reunite the MSI bot lane. So I guess my spot You got to go Dardock then. You can't put Medios and Aphromoo back together. Why not? They're going to make up and be happy again. It's going to be someday Medios, Crown, Aphromoo, Stixie. That's my lineup. All right. I like mine better. So who is yours? Yours is Bio and Cody Sun? Yeah. And who's your jungler? Medios. Medios? I take Dardock, but CLG bot lane. Okay. okay. All right. Time to move on. Let's get to this patch 9.6. Guess what? Urgot is returned. Is jungler Urgot now? is broken. Isn't he a jungler? We had He's a small, 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 brief time period where we were free of Urgot's reign of terror. Um, and Urgot has been changed, very heavily changed, once again, to come back with a vengeance in this patch. Yeah. Gave him, they gave him back a bunch of mana, mana regeneration. They switched the shield to his E. They made it so the W can become a permanent toggle later on. And if you just look at the numbers, it solo queue win rate went up like six, seven percent. Yeah, I, I don't even understand where the damage comes from in his kit. I, I've had, I had a game where I was playing against him and I was playing Vi and I was two levels up on this Urgot top lane. I had a full item up on him. Mm. And I got slammed one v one, and I was just so confused as to how I died. And I've Did watched he hit you games. with the E. Uh, the E maybe I don't even know, man. I'm, I'm so I blocked it out. But I, I've, been watching, <laughs> I've been watching Shurnfire playing at jungle a fair bit, and he has had some ridiculous games on it. He's been streaming as well. Uh, it feels super crazy, and the the W being permanently up once you hit level nine and you have it maxed out seems really really powerful. I think Urga is back in there 100. percent Yeah. Also, they did add base damage onto the R 75 mm -hmm. at rank one. Um, so just for the full combo for trying to take someone down. 75 base damage, extra chunking someone. Well, 75 on top of the 50, so it's 125. Yeah, yeah 75 yeah. extra. So yeah, 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 just make sure. Um, that extra damage can chunk them into execution range yeah. much easier. And so, and that's what you have to get to with Urgot, right? Is your 100% range, because then you can flash in with a big fear and 
uh, all that stuff. I, so adding even just a little bit of flat damage onto a long cooldown like that for him is a really big deal. Yeah. He looks pretty dumb. <laughs> Yay, he's back. To it. Also, quick shout out to the last dive episode that we did on 9.6, where I talked about really enjoying Hecarim, but conceding that top he's laner. a better top laner, even though uh, Freak was like, oh, well, he's mostly played as a jungler. Now, there was a there was a Reddit post after our dive episode about top lane Hecarim, yeah. and now it's all the rage. And you I'm made sad because now I will never get a jungle because everyone's picking a top lane now. You can still be a hipster. You can and still play it. He's probably going to get picked in the LCS for top lane. I mean, we talked about it last time when we originally brought up the topic, but licorice and I've seen a lot of the other top laners practicing it as well. Yeah, more bruisey. I think I think it's definitely in there. You ready for some more Kyle talk? Yeah, Kale. <laughs> Kale. I think so. Nine point six. I think it was it was coined as like a power shift or whatever because uh -huh. they nerfed some of his base stats. But the E and W changes were actually really really impactful. They feel so much better. E feels much closer to a true auto reset. The W is much more reactive, and you lose less DPS time when you're using it. So it's actually easier to, to actually dodge out on skill shots. Uh, the E feels like a really, really positive change for Kale. And people are just learning Kale more and more. So the win rate has been steadily creeping up. Kale's, I think, OP on 9.6. Yeah. And I think because it had snuck in on 9.5, and people have had so much time to learn it now, I do think it will get play in playoffs because this is 9.6. Nerfs are going to be coming in 9.7, and then maybe it falls out again. But I think certainly for playoffs, it's going to be in a very important pick, especially since some of the other tanks and whatnot got buffed. So if you bring tanks back in, Kale is fantastic because it's harder to punish her in those early stages with lower damage champions. Did you watch Academy playoffs? Yes, I watched both the Kale games. Yeah, the Echo Fox games were really cool what they did with it because they would combo it with like Rakan or another engager. Well, they only played it the one time, but yeah. They played it twice. Loyal? Yeah. Yeah, he played, yeah, he played oh, two games. Oh, you're right, you're right, you're right. They banned right. it once like, also. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they started banning it towards the end of the series. Yeah. Um, but what was really cool is they would combo with an engager, and he mm -hmm. would do the AP build. So it's like a 0.8 ratio on the, the alt. And so they would just throw it on Rakan, who would alt in, round everyone up while being invulnerable, drop the damage, and then alt out. Yeah. And it was this disgusting combination. And I think once I saw that, I was like, oh, there's a lot more uses for this alt than I initially thought of just like save someone. Yeah, type it's, it's, actually, it's actually way better used as an engager. I've played yeah. a lot of the kale and we, you know, the, we were doing the kale segment where Freak actually ended up presenting it, but it was uh, stuff that like Your I, was, brain I was power. talking about it. Yeah, um, and, and I do think it's by far the best on a hard engaged champion because you're actually losing so much damage time, especially late game. People talk about, oh, you know, post 16 kale is so incredible at doing damage. You can actually kill a squishy in the 1.5 seconds sometimes that you're locked out from using your ultimate. So it's actually often better to just immediately ultimate at the start of the fight on a hard engage. It's getting a tremendous amount of value. It deals extra damage. It's giving that person free reign in the back line. And then you are no longer locked out for when the fight actually starts and you can get a lot of DPS out. Uh, AP build seems for sure the standard in pro. And I think that's partially like I've talked to a number of the top laners. I think the AP build is just stronger in the early game because you're building CDR and there's heavier AP scaling on both the heal, which gives you additional move speed from AP as well, and the ultimate. Uh, that being said, I do think if you can survive early as AD, which is harder to do because you're not building CDR, you don't have AP, you're basically not able to auto attack at all in a team fight until you're 11 where you have range, but it is a higher DPS build and I think it's more powerful at that point. But yeah, I think it's a bit of a bait and more of a solo queue thing because it's like yeah. the, yes, I can actually 1v9. Like late game AD Kale is yeah. you're definitely at that point and you can just like but you incinerate might not get there. everybody around you. Um, but yeah, I, I went to dinner with Lorlo and uh, he was like, yeah, like you don't even like need to get to that God mode point with this champion. The execution damage on the E is also like a super underrated part of the kit mm -hmm. it was like 20 percent uh missing health damage on the e and he was a big fan of going burst uh with the like Bane proc. exactly yeah. and a revolver proc and he's like just with that i can you know take someone out of the fight especially when he's using the ult early so like you get this big chunk of damage then you get uh all the burst coming from items and stuff too mm -hmm. um and i think that i agree like that's probably going to be mostly what we see in pro but as, for solo queue um even my boy Hotshot has come back and been spamming Kale in solo queue. It's actually just broken. And every other time that he's come back, he's kind of like, 
um, like played for a while and like got fed up and left. Uh, but now he actually is like hard climbing with kale. I looked at his <laughs> match history and it's like all these green kale games. I'm like, oh, shit. It's so much fun when you get the broken champ that people aren't banning yet. Yeah. yeah. I mean, people are starting to, though. People are starting to ban it, but it, it's funny because it's Kale is fun to lane against because Kale's lane is so bad. You get so slapped people, around before you lose, or people, you get to slap her around before. Exactly. Yeah. So it's one of those things where it's like people often are going to ban the champions they're most frustrating to lane against because that's kind of their experience, right? But Kale scales so well now, and, and people are getting good enough at it that you're not so far behind that you're not useless. But I do still think that Kale's late game, while really strong, is still somewhat overblown as yeah. like, oh, it's free win once you get to 16. And we did see in the Academy Series the second day, and I'm forgetting who actually played it, uh, I want to say it was like Fallen Bandit, but I could be wrong. Um, but it was played in the second Academy series at the day after Lorelo played, or maybe it was later that day. And uh, it was against, I mean, Insanity was playing Vladimir and absolutely clapped to Kale late game. Kale got to 16. Kale had all the items and then was instantly dying at the start of basically every team fight, right? Like F Insanity on Vladimir was forcing self alt instantaneously. And then Kale would be 20%, come out of the alt and die. Yep. And so it, it's not a guaranteed win once you get late game. I do think that Kale is the best 5v5 frontline hits frontline. You alt your frontline and then slap their their guy because post 16, you're getting true damage. You have percent missing health damage, you know, and you have this kind of setup where you're actually consistently able to get DPS. But I do think it's long range hyper carries and divers who can force you to self alt instead of using it as engage. It can be very, very difficult to actually get enough DPS out in those fights. So it'll be interesting to see if people have prepared enough with Kale to really understand where it fits. Or if it just becomes a situation where people just think it's generically powerful and are not picking in in appropriate situations, which I felt like kind of happened to York in NA. Because I think York still never won a single game in NA. I think it lost every single game. And, Let's go. And it, people were universally agreeing that it was really good, but it, it never really maybe had enough practice or never were really able to put it in a situation where it really would succeed. Yeah, definitely agree. I think the only other ones that are hitting pro play, Zoe Nerf. Mm -hmm. uh, substantial, so he's super high priority mid laner, and I really like this nerf of increasing the cooldown on Sleepy Trouble Bubble. So you just have more of a cost in the mid game when you're throwing all these out Fishing. to look for picks. And Zaya, to me, big attack speed boost. She's already getting picked. Uh, the Zyra Khan combo is that broken. was such a weird one to me. Yeah, but. that they just slapped on some extra, yeah, it was like a significant amount of a, of attack speed after she's uh, getting picked a lot in pro play at the very least. Yeah. I think uh, just based like the the holistic group of these changes makes playoffs really interesting because it's it's a lot of top lane changes in general, mm -hmm. uh, and so like people were playing Silas and flexing it up there sometimes. Where does Silas land? Uh, we start seeing Cho'Gath, we start seeing Poppy. Orin got a, a very minor buff, but we are starting to see him as well now with the Kale Shen buff. Shen buff, like it's to me very interesting where this all lands because we were talking about impact earlier. Both TSM and C9, the other top three teams, are super lane or top lane focused, it feels like. And then TL, TL is the opposite. So if yeah. they can pick these tanks and just kind of be like, go up there, you're fine, then that's actually huge for TL. But they're if counting it, their blessings for the Jace nerf, right? <laughs> yeah. The Jace nerf plus the tank buffs, you're like, maybe they can just give them tanks and they can they can be fine. Or it's the complete opposite where there's still enough carries that like you can't do this. And now Kale's this thing that doesn't really seem to fit TL's play style and this and that. I, th I think Kale actually, I would argue a little bit that could fit his play style because I think it plays similarly to how he used to play on GP where it's just like survive and farm and just try to live and then you'll be really useful late in team fighting, which I think is where he is really good. Uh, I think the picks that Impact isn't as successful on are the ones that have, to, have to slam lane because yeah. you need to play aggressive. You need to push space. Otherwise, you're not as useful. Kale is like, it's okay if he's actually down 20, 30, 40 CS as long as he's getting experience and not just getting absolutely blasted. Even Lorlo in the game, but he he won. He was getting slammed in lane. He was having jungle help, and he was down 35 CS in lane, and then one late, right? Yeah, but so the, the jungle helps. similar to GP. The jungle helps the interesting part, though, mm -hmm. because they don't help impact. And so, like, I don't think you can pick Kale and not help top. The, the game that they, they ended up losing, the second mm -hmm. time they played it, uh, Panda went top and actually countered every single gank so the Kale was even. Then mm -hmm. they just forced a bunch of stupid fights before the Kale was online. But, like... They camp top to protect it, which feels a little bit like what you're based off what I saw in those games mm -hmm. is what you're supposed to do. And that still is not really in line with their play style, even if like the kind of just sack them early to be a team fight champion yeah. later. The only other thing is that the minion dematerializer changes are also going to be interesting for mid lane roamers. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to put more work into um, especially cannon minion waves. You only have three charges now. You can get 
a bigger percentage uh, quicker on cannons. Um, but you don't get the instant clear six times. I'm out to bottom. Thank lane. God, by the way. Someone someone uh, mentioned this. I can't, I want to give credit to who it was, but I, I can't remember where I, where I heard this. So sorry. Uh, someone <laughs> I'm sure will uh, will mention it in the comments or whatever. But uh, someone was pointing out that this could actually be a really big change. Maybe it was LS uh, for for singed, which I thought was like, oh, that's kind of interesting because uh, you don't have well, as many it, charges, yeah, but just the percentage damage on minions would be pretty effective for singed. Uh, so that that's kind of interesting because that was also a, a champion that impact brought out. So I wonder if that will actually have. Uh, much of a boost there on yeah. him because singe like when you're doing your poison trail uh like back through the minion waves the exactly. cannon is the one that lives uh, unless you spend extra time and I mean, you can use all three on cannon minions to get the big amp mm -hmm. all right time for playoff though boys let's get Wait. into the previews oh, let's start with uh saturday okay. um the golden guardians rematch versus FlyQuest. Uh, which way do you see it going, Azale? You casted both of their games last weekend as the preview. How did the homework turn out? Uh, it's it's hard to say because we didn't even get to see Santorin playing in the second one, though FlyQuest did win. Maxi no. subbed in and, and played a solid game. Uh, the earlier game in the day, I didn't actually cast. I cast just a tiebreaker. But the earlier game, FlyQuest did lose with Santorin, then they won without Santorin. Um, I think this is a very evenly matched set of teams so i actually think this could go very much either way um i think that golden guardians was in a pretty good position in both games even even in the second one it felt like they kind of threw away what was a pretty big advantage they had an inhibitor down uh they kept trying to split when you know flyquest drafted like all these massive forms of engage that were able to punish them and, and flyquest executed that really well i want to say i give golden guardians maybe a slight edge i just feel like they've played hmm. really well down the stretch but i think I think from watching both those games, it feels incredibly closely matched. And I think it comes down a lot to the execution of these teams and, and how they're going to work as a squad. I think FlyQuest at their best, still from from week one all the way to, to this tiebreaker game, at their best, they're drafting lots of forms of engage and they're team fighting. And I think that they're really, really good at pulling the trigger on those and, and forcing those moments and putting the opponents into awkward positions. So I think if FlyQuest is able to draft that sort of a style and Golden Guardians is trying to do side lane and split push, and that's often what they are doing with scaling picks from Froggen and Enhancer, I think FlyQuest wins out that series if they're able to get lots of engage. But if Golden Guardians tries to go for like kind of like a matching, just like grouping and fighting style, I think that they have a really good chance. Either way, I think it's probably going to be 3-2. Like, it feels so close, and to me, it comes down a lot to the styles they play and the drafts they can get. Yeah, that's interesting. I was going to give the edge to FlyQuest, actually, because I feel like Turtle and JJ um, had kind of kind of underperformed uh, last weekend. And I feel like that bottom lane should be uh, an advantage over the Golden Guardians bottom lane for uh, the majority of a five-game series. I feel like that... If you like look at where they stack up, like soul lanes are probably in favor of Golden Guardians, jungle probably in favor of FlyQuest, bot lane mm -hmm. probably in favor of FlyQuest, mm -hmm. maybe some better teamwork in favor of FlyQuest. Uh, so that's why I think it feels so close, is because like even when yeah. there there are those advantages, it's not like huge mismatch in the top lane. It's it's still pretty close, and mm -hmm. it can swing a lot based on the draft. The thing that I hope Golden Guardians doesn't do is that side, side lane crap. I don't think they're good at it at all. <laughs> and like, FlyQuest is so good at punishing it. Yeah, so I hope they don't pick LeBlanc. Like I think Froggen's the Blanc in lane is, and in the early game is gross, but they never manage to like convert that into the leads the correct way that whenever they pick it. So like mm -hmm. I hope they go late game. It feels like this is gonna be a long team fight focused series based off how their other two games look. They were not stomps uh mm -hmm. from, from Sunday. So I also probably put it in favor of Golden Guardians for me, but it is super close and I think a lot of it comes down to draft and just who's playing better. Cause I think that's something yeah. that happens all the time is someone just not that great that day. And, and adaptation to 9-6, right? You know, yep. who's who's actually going to have the correct choices going into it? I think it's so incredibly important when you are taking, especially when top lane has been so key and there's so many changes up in the top lane. Like, is the Hecarim thing actually going to really work? Have you practiced that? Is Kale super nuts? You know, can you actually just go back to playing Shen and, and play full tanks the whole time? You know, having the correct read and implementing that throughout the course of the series and being able to adapt to, oh, okay, well, Hecarim actually hard failed. We need to change now. The team that does that and has a better read may actually be the one that comes out on top. But, I mean, I, I want to predict Golden Guardians because I I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt that they see that the, the split push style hasn't, hasn't worked as well for them because I think that when I think of a lot of their games that 
have fallen apart is that style, the long stuff, even against the, in the tiebreaker, you know, the rise split bush style build that he was going for. But it was against like Nocturne and uh, God, was it even it was Nocturne, Rakan, um, who else was it? I don't know. I just remember they had like four forms of engage and they were doing a really good job of picking those fights and coming back. Uh, but we'll see. I was going to mention coaching staff mm. because I think that's something that's probably in favor of FlyQuest as well. Invert. Invert has been pretty good. They'll have Cop as well. And we kind of didn't talk about Coach of the Split before. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to go back too far. But I do think Invert, potential Coach of the Split candidate, is another another advantage for FlyQuest. Yeah. It's funny because we both talk to Cop a lot because you live with him. And he's like in my Discord You group. guys are like a little family who like watches <laughs> Korean variety shows together or yeah. something. Yeah. We, we do have our um, Running Man episodes. But um yeah, so like that's uh, I, I do feel like one of the big factors when there's a team like FlyQuest where um, even the people that predicted FlyQuest like decently high at the at the beginning of the split did not have them fourth place, right? Mm -hmm. And this is a roster where you have valid points of bringing in Viper straight up from Academy, uh, you know, putting together a lot of guys that have been on successful teams but not been the star player of their successful team. And I think that when we don't have all this great insight into all of coaching staffs and, and you know, practices and all the uh, time, when you do see that type of success with those pieces, you have to make that leap of, okay, something good must have gone on here yeah. to be able to make that sort of success come together, mm -hmm. even with the lull that they had in the split. It, it's funny that you mentioned that too, because I remember, I, I forgot about talking about this earlier during the power rankings, but I remember... Another thing that had come up was, you know, like when when St. Vicious, uh, you know, got replaced, mm -hmm. was was the coaching staff going to work out as well? And, you know, there were certainly concerns of like, oh, they, you know, JJ and all these guys have given so much credit to St. Vicious. Well, they're probably screwed now that they lost their coach. And now you're talking about Invert as potential coach of the split. I think job well done to <laughs> yeah. FlyQuest, right? To be able to actually bounce back from losing your head coach, who everyone had said had such an impact on the squad. Uh, and to be able to make it all the way to fourth and to have people giving so much credit to them, I think that is a tough position to step into when you lose a well-known coach and you have to succeed right away. And they've done a fantastic job with that. And uh, people also underestimate like the other parts of coaching staff. So uh, whenever I give that award, I do kind of look at it as the holistic yeah. like staff award. Yeah. Because uh, with St. Vicious and uh, all of his success coaching, Cop has been his assistant coach for totally. most of that time, right? And so they did lose him, but they kind of kept Cop. So you keep some pieces, and then Invert came in and did a good job as well. And he was with the team before with their academy. Yeah, team, with, so it was kind of like promotion within. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. All right, so Mark and I, Golden Guardians, slight favorite. You have FlyQuest, it sounds like, slight favorite. Mm -hmm. All right, so... Uh, the other thing that we obviously got to talk about here is going <laughs> to be other TSM thing. versus Echo Fox mm, on go, Sunday. Go over it. Uh, people are talking a lot about is TSM the most powerful team going into playoffs? They were what ten and one in their last eleven, something like that. Two zero over TL. Would Certainly you call felt them like they Titans? Were on a rise. A sale? <laughs> Would they be perhaps going up against the Titan Killers? Whoa, that sounds like an exciting matchup, Azale. It sounds like a narrative. Um, honestly, though, uh, we had that great interview from Zazel uh, on Echo Fox, them beating Team Luca, them beating Cloud9, uh, going, what was a 4-0 at the, the end of the week. split, mm -hmm. making their run into After playoffs. Exactly. And it does seem like, you know, subbing Rush back in, he looks so much better. People... Also, I have had this feeling like they want to see Rush too well. <laughs> and I feel like them having this success was like a sigh of relief for a lot of people to, you know, finally see some success there. But even though I would still give TSM the advantage, it gives this matchup a bit more excitement. That Echo Fox ended so strongly. Mm -hmm. I think it's the more hype matchup, but the less close matchup as well. I think TSM's probably going to win this one pretty easily. Um, I think as great as Echo Fox has been, they haven't been very explosive, yeah. which is like actually a good thing for them because the problem in, in, earlier in the season was like they would die. Rush was leading the league in deaths, and then he gets subbed out, comes back in. I think he's only died a handful of times now in the four-game win streak, but I don't think that's what they need to beat a TSM that looks really good, looks like they're very well-coordinated, and ends games pretty quickly. Um so it feels like if you go this kind of slower style and then 
being very intelligent about picking their fights and stuff. I just don't think that matches up very well with TSM right now. Yeah. And that's the concern for me is how they got into playoffs while very impressive and who they beat. I didn't like the style matchup versus TSM. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely what what I'm looking at a lot too. And certainly it was hype to see Rush come back in and them do really well, but I felt like the bigger story besides Rush coming in was the fact that they actually found a style that worked for them. And that style was all late, right? Pick Vladimir every time it's up. Azir. Azir Vladimir Jinx was was the first game against C9. And it's that's about as much scaling as you can get when you're looking at 5v5. You have a damage amp and a massive team fight from Vladimir for two of the strongest team fight champions coming out of bot lane and mid lane, right? And I think that worked incredibly well if you can get there. That is really the question. And I also just think that if you are TSM and you have a tremendous amount of confidence in your early stages of the game, you can also just ban out all these late game picks, right? You can't ban out everything that's late game. Of course, there are the multiple powerful late game champions, but I think you always want to ban Vladimir. Solo is basically taking that anytime it's up. I think you want to ban Jinx. I think you are maybe more okay with something like Azir being picked when your mid laner is Bjergsen and you feel like, hey, he can maybe abuse that. Um, but we have seen that TSM is willing to go early game with the Kalista pick you know, with some of these aggressive mid lane picks. And I think that they are a team that that stylistically should be pretty favored. For Echo Fox, it's really going to be all about how many picks of this style do you have and can you withstand the onslaught early? Because whether you're a little bit worse at team fighting or, or late game or not, if you just draft like an incredible 5v5 late game and you have Kale in there instead of Vlad or whatever, maybe you just win regardless if you can get there. Um, but that, I think that is the biggest question. And and then anytime it's a situation like that, I feel like so much of the onus goes on the jungler to protect your lanes, to get vision, to be counter ganking. And that can start to feel like you're plugging all these holes in a sinking ship. And I feel like there was kind of, we saw a game like that uh, from Optic on the final weekend where they picked Kog'Maw and they picked all the scaling and, and Meteos was trying to run around the map and help everyone, but they had three losing lanes and it can look really bad sometimes. Yeah, I saw a lot of people trying to pigeonhole uh, Echo Fox into being just, oh, going super late game after that game uh, versus CLG, mm -hmm. when I'm like, all right, they know who they're drafting against, right? It's a strategy. Oh, it's a C9 game. Uh, CLG was the Cassidy game. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, CLG was also super yeah. scaling, yeah. so it like builds up and you and you get that um, feeling. There, there are examples of like their Team Liquid win that they got mm -hmm. with Lissandra, Jarvan, Aatrox, and Kogma Lulu. I don't feel like that is excessive uh, scaling. No, those are excessive. exactly those are not losing lanes. So uh, I don't think that they have to be pigeonholed into this go late or bust strategy. And no, Kogma Lulu still is. Kogma your, your Lulu is scaling, is still, like, but it's not. Fight late. It's it's not like Kogma is is garbage early with Lulu. And Kogma it, actually, with Lulu, I agree. Well, it, Kogma it, operates very well with uh, Rage Blade early on. And it was a counter pick into Jinx, and yeah, Kogma is yeah. actually really good into and, Jinx. And he went hella blades. Like it's yeah. not a. It's, this is not a the Kog Kogma late game of old or whatever. Yeah. I, I do think, though, that a lot of it also in that game depended on support matchup because they picked range support in Tom Kench. Tom Kench is one of the weakest laning supports, and Lulu is actually, I think, a very strong laning support. Um, we saw the game before that. I think it was actually the game right before that earlier in the day uh, where Optic played it, and their their COG got blasted. Yeah. And and I would be scared to pick something like that into into TSM if they're if like if instead of the you know Tom Kench jinx, it's like. Thresh and Callista or whatever, that is Which really, really TSM scary. TSM has been playing really aggressive bot lane. So that is the thing where it becomes like, I think Echo Fox can win. I think it's an outside chance. It has to be kind of one of those upset situations. Like we saw, hey, Clutch last year uh, beat, TSM. beat TSM, right? And TSM was actually on an 8-1 and one or 9-1 and one streak going into playoffs before they lost. So these things can happen. But I think it comes down so much to draft to protecting some of these lanes because I think if you get into a situation where it's just like raw laning power, Zen and Smoothie have been scary. Yeah, I just don't like people applying old drafts to a new opponent. I would give the That's coaching fair. staff more credit uh, than that. And even the things that you're talking about, they picked, uh, they only picked Cog Lulu. It only worked because it was into Tom Ken's Jinx. Like, they, they drafted yeah. it afterwards, right? That is a, a yeah. choice that they made in their draft phase due to their coaching staff. And so I think there is credit that is deserved there. I agree. I still think TSM are the big favorites coming into it. But I want to give Echo Fox uh, some credit, right? The one thing the I will... Rush lover. The one thing I will <laughs> argue against with that is 
I feel like most people also talk about C9 as a, as a really strong early game team and a team that can close uh-huh. out games. And and that was the game that Echo Fox drafted Azir, Jinx, Vladimir uh-huh. into, into C9. And they did win because C9 kind of bungled the mid game and, and then couldn't win late in a 5v5. Yeah. Um, but that was another team where C9 actually has one of the fastest game times, if not the fastest in the whole league. They're known for their early game. They're known for closing out. And they still did that style of draft. So I would not be shocked if it's open, if they just try the same thing against TSM and just say, we hope we withstand the storm and then we win late if we do. Yeah, I mean, I feel like they're going to, as the draft unfolds and as the best of five unfolds, I think they'll be able to adapt. I think that's what's pretty interesting. It's not on the rift so much, but I think both coaching staffs have been really good. Mm -hmm. I think TSM with Tony and Parth and... Goldman, who I always call Plop, but he wants to go by Goldman now. Like th- those Plop guys, such a funny. Name. <laughs> that's why I kill, it's so much better. It's a good name. Yeah, I love it. But now he's Goldman. Uh, I think they have been great over the course of the season, in getting this TSM squad on the same side. And I think Echo Fox and Song recently have like all those drafts were smart mm-hmm. uh, for the yeah. most part. So, you know, the hyperscaling and the cast in late pick, like maybe it's a little scary. You're picking so many losing lanes, but like you said, it's against CLG who don't win early. So great. And so they, they have been smart about drafting towards their opponents. And I think that's one of the interesting things about this series is what both t- coaching staffs and teams come up with on a new patch. Yeah, I, I agree. And I definitely think that Zix and Goldman are in there for Coach of the Split awards yeah, as another well. One. I think those are, they're probably top two uh, for me somewhere there. So I'm, I'm hoping for an exciting series. That being said, I have yes, my favorite TSM, TSM 30. Uh, I, I I do think that T, TSM like so as much as people talk about them as an early team, they had one of the longest game times, average game times of any team in the split. They were at one point the longest. I haven't checked in the last couple of weeks, so I don't know exactly where they're sitting Weren't now. There, I think it was their their game time was long, but, but their, their their win time their win, was okay. Well, their win time was pretty slow too. It was like second slowest <laughs> because week. they have. But act- that was that was a couple of weeks ago, so I don't know if yeah. it's the same now. They actually had an insane comeback win ratio. It was like seven and one. Yeah. Uh, comeback ratio for when yeah, behind. And, and so. they always had like a good goal difference. Yeah. But either way, yeah. that being said, I, I still do see this as like a 3-1 or even a 3-0 TSM. I think that they can play late. Uh, they have played lots of late games against, against Echo Fox. And I do give them the credit that Echo Fox, though they have had intelligent drafts, it has felt like it has revolved very much around team fighting and late game scaling. Right, and I think that especially for the bot lane, that has been important. The Kogma and the Jinx and these sorts of picks, I think those can be abused by some of the style of, of play that we've seen out of TSM. Sven can play Draven. Sven can play Callista. Um, I think that Bjergsen is a guy who can slam picks like Azir and cast it in, in lane, unless it's a, you know really really good draft for Echo Fox. So I definitely heavily favor TSM. Yeah, I think everybody heavily favors TSM. For the record. Average game time for TSM is 39 minutes. Slowest. So slowest, slowest by a full two minutes. Yeah, the next go. slowest is 100 Thieves, and they're two minutes faster average game so time. So that's that's what's so funny to me, is people talk so much about TSM being the early game aggressive team, and they do draft some really early game picks, but they often play the game so risk averse late. So it's like they draft Callista and they slam lane, but then they're like, ooh, but we should wait for the Baron to close. Well, I, I feel like watching a lot of the games, to me, they have played aggressively in the early game. Akkadian yeah. goes invading. Bjergsen helps him out. Bjergsen roams. Top. Bjergsen has the highest first blood rate for mid laners. However, a lot of their games, especially earlier in the split, they would make mistakes yeah. after that, right? And then they would have to dig themselves out of these mistakes and still find some wins. So, yes, the average game time is incredibly long. And it has sped up a little bit because it used to be over 40, and now it's like 39. <laughs> it's 39.2. I think what people talk about with their aggressive early game stuff, though, is more about second highest goal difference at 15. They yeah. talk about they have the second. They're tied for first for first turret percentage. So they are really good about getting early game leads. Maybe they're not quite C9 levels of, like, smashing once they get those leads. But, like, if you are going to go full scaling against a team that is good about getting leads, I think that's that's it. Is that not concerning, though? You know, if you're looking forward, if you're thinking, okay, everything goes as expected. TSM beats Echo Fox. Uh, you were Everyone's expecting TL to pick the winner of FlyQuest versus Golden Guardians, which would mean it's TSM versus Cloud9, right? You know, is that not concerning then? Great. You you get all these leads. You have all these big leads. Then why are you the slowest team in the league? Yeah, people are definitely concerned because... And that's why everyone always cites the consistency of TSM. Mm-hmm. It's because of uh, some of the mistakes. Also, uh, don't overlook that it's Apollo and Hakuo yet again, spring split playoffs. 
Thrust, uh, baby, let's go. So uh, be careful about oh, yes. <laughs> be, be careful about things going as expected. <laughs> PSM fans immediately pissed off if Thresh doesn't get banned first game. No, I'm already looking towards the C9 match. C9 versus TSM. C9 actually has the fastest game time in the league, so that's why I think they got the 2-0 over. <laughs> I like I'm completely it. talking past Echo Fox. All right. So uh you're I assume you're you're all TSM favored. Yeah. Okay, sweet. Uh, those those are our predictions. We got some Twitter questions here. First one is from Supa, from at GG Supa. He says, Boots and League of Legends have been pretty boring and one-dimensional since we dropped the enchants on them. What are your guys' thoughts about <laughs> reimagining how Boots function in League? He says, I love how Cass doesn't even have to build them. <laughs> um, I could do with a new version of Boots, but I feel decently good about my choices right now. Um... I might need a little bit of extra spice on something like Boots of Speed to make it a little more interesting. And maybe it's because I'm a jungler, but mm -hmm. I find that in different situations, I buy different boots. Uh, and that's kind of the design goal that you want with an item slot like that that's guaranteed. Everyone's going to have a boot. Uh, I get Merc Treads when there is magic damage and crowd control, or you know, I change my runes for tenacity if there's no magic damage and crowd control. Um, the default uh, for a lot of junglers is Ninja Tabby because attack damage is always going to be there. Moby Boots are a very good early game option for accelerating um, you know, lots of volatile lanes and ganking. And then Boots of Speed are super niche if you're Vi or... Something. Uh, like, yeah. I was trying to come up with another one. I was, almost said Hecarim, and I was like, no, it's Boots of I think Mobility there's, every I think time. some but, very rare situations so, where in top lane, too. But at the very least, I'm yeah. glad that there's some variation of the Mercs, Tabby, Boots of Speed. And uh, I think that junglers are and supports are, are probably the only ones that ever get Boots of Mobility. So yeah. maybe that's those role. Other roles need more differentiation. I think other roles could use it because one of the problems is like, some champions who want to build CDR, you never build the CDR boots because there's CDR tacked onto every item in the game now. So mm -hmm. like a mage who wants CDR is actually probably not getting it from the boots because they're getting it from the other 10 items that have sent CDR, even though half of it's unique with haste now or whatever. It's starting to get more complicated, mm -hmm. but I think same with like a Riven is like what boots you love because you often get CDR from like your Death Stance and Black Cleaver and then you don't really want your Lucidity boots. Maybe you're going Transcendence. There are ways to interact with it, but I think mages could could use a little bit more and marksmen just always going the attack speed ones can feel a little like uninspired if you're playing some of those roles mm -hmm. and i guess the enchant idea i would be fine to play around with because yeah it was like more fun enchants were cool they tax um, put they put like half of them in the game normally like everyone gets home guards now on their own yeah i i feel like so i like playing with moby boots they're the only boots i'm ever actually excited to get and I only get them when, I, when I'm when i playing jungle or support and not even every game. Uh -huh. But those are the only ones when I'm trying to think about it where I'm like, sweet, I have it. Because I feel like it actually changes how I play. The other boots, it's not that there's good, never good situations. I feel like, yes, this is the correct one. Great, I have a big brain. I bought Merc Treads against Thresh Morgana or whatever, right? Um, but I do think that boots are somewhat kind of boring like he's talking about. I think it's it feels somewhat similar to the conundrum that there was with Sightstone, right? Everyone needs to buy Sightstone. It's not that fun or exciting to buy, but you have to do it. So they put in the support quest. And I think that was a more interesting way to do it where you buy this boot gold quest. generation item. Yeah, like maybe, maybe you know, their boot quest, it sounds funny. And, and something like how much you run around the map to give you boots would be really stupid. But like there, maybe it should just be something where you can more automatically get it, right? And, and it's one of the reasons I really like playing with the free ass boots room because I'm never excited about my boot completion. I'm always wanting, ah, oh, it's like a pit stop. I have to do it in this matchup. Oh, I need Tabby to survive against Jace. Oh, I need Mercs because I'm playing against this. I, but I want my Triforce. I want my Zonius, right? You know, you want that big item. So if it's not fun, if it's not exciting, maybe there is a, a more interesting way we can get around that and, and the designers can maybe come up with some cool things to make them feel more unique or exciting. Because I do think legit the only boot I'm ever excited to have is Moby's when I'm playing Bard and I'm roaming everywhere or I'm playing one shot Hecarim or like an early game jungler that can just run around the map because then you actually feel like there's a difference. The other ones I'm like, yeah, this was the right choice, but I'm never excited. Yeah, as soon as you said that, Mark, I started thinking of like, 
All right. If you spend five minutes in the river, you turn into having water moccasins on your feet. You got some flippers, you're flopping around. Or, you know, if you're playing Kha'Zix and you assassinate like three people in a time limit, then your boots have guns on them all of a sudden and you can <laughs> shoot I people. I thought they were going to be like stealth boots. Yeah, that's what I guns? thought it was going to. Yeah. What? I was like, that makes sense. Kobe, he's like, then you get a bazooka. <laughs> but, bazooka boots. Exactly. But then I was like, okay, so like, most of the exciting things don't make sense on your feet. <laughs> you steal a dragon, you start riding on one. Yeah. So, so like there, I can see some ways to make them more exciting. I think the uh, the lore or the theory they might have to work on it a little bit to make it make sense. Because I don't know, boots might not be the most exciting accessory. I liked I liked the enchantment idea though. Like yeah. uh, everyone went home guards yeah. if they were top lane because it was. It was broken on TP and stuff like that. But I thought, you know, captain like the captain enchant was, was cool. Like you're faster running towards it. So you're supporting the back line who takes mm -hmm. it. And like, I think there's, there's the bazooka room. Enchant. The bazooka boots. Work on the bazooka enchant. What does we'll it get do, the designers Kobe? on it. <laughs> what it, what it, it shoots just, a bazooka. <laughs> right. But is it just damage? Are you dumb? <laughs> do you have to activate it? Is it, or is it a three hit? Yeah. Active? You have to activate oh, it. Yeah. How, what's the range? It's not an automatic bazooka. Is it AOE? <laughs> Bazookas are hard to reload too. Is it's it got a AOE? long cooldown. So you have to stop moving to reload your boots. <laughs> yeah. You're just taking yeah. your shoe off in the middle exactly. of the fight. There's a whole animation for it. You, <laughs> you got to put up in the air. You got to get the other bazooka rocket out of your boot after you use one and then stick it on the bottom. This sounds like a, it's going to be something I'm going to avoid in games, so I can't get a three kill. In, oh, but oh. your bazooka does a thousand damage, by the way. Oh, oh okay. and it's, it's map wide. <laughs> oh, it's just yeah. Jinx rocket. Yeah, on your feet. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right, next question here from <laughs> Michael Chamnus uh, at Monkey eighty four. Uh, he says, with all the lower teams playing much better late split, is this a sign that NA as a region is getting stronger, or is the top NA talent getting weaker and the region getting worse? Uh. I am firmly in the region getting better camp because I was pretty vocal, maybe too much, about how bad I thought we were when mm -hmm. we like pulled up those stats for the Twilight Zone uh, ripoff, the Fiesta Zone. And we were talking about how that like, was original content. How dare you? Right. 46% uh, win rate with First Blood, like only a 65% win rate uh, yeah. for lead at 15. And both those were like 20% lower than global averages for those kinds of advantages. That was terrifying for me. I was like, we are so bad. Not necessarily Team Liquid, maybe yeah. not C9, but like as a region. But I think the clump actually improved. So teams like Echo Fox rose through it. Golden Guardians rose through it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I feel a lot better about the rest of the playoff teams heading into playoffs than I would have felt week six, week seven. Yeah, most of it to me is just looking at the games and looking at the decisions that are made. Not even necessarily uh, the stats, which are mm -hmm. kind of indicators and, and point to problems, but... Just looking at the games recently, um, it, there are some where you're like, all right, these teams have fallen to the bottom and they've fallen to, a, to the bottom for a reason. And mm -hmm. I think that is good when we do have the filter, right? And, and the stronger teams are climbing to the top because of their more consistency and better plays being pulled off. Like you're saying, I feel like the top echelon kind of did that earlier on but it was only a couple of teams right yeah even tsm had a lot of mistakes early on in the season they were part of the problem with those leads they, exactly they take forever um but i think towards the end a lot of it did get a lot clearer yeah I, I think that you know one of the things with na you know especially like if you're comparing to eu is that it feels like the talent is more spread out among the teams like i i have felt and zabatine had a tweet about this and yeah i kind of agreed with it where it was like okay you know eu internationally their top teams have been have been better the middle is kind of like similar but the bottom of na to me generally has had had been stronger teams right than some of the other leagues when you compare because even some of the worst teams have some strong players on them when you're looking at guys like crown you're talking about oh he's really impressive and someday and bang and like all these guys um even some of the worst teams in the league have some things that are positives for them that are really going for them where you're like oh but maybe this guy could win it for them and and i think that's that's one of the things is that like even even i've found that over the years it has get it has gotten harder and harder to do the the rankings of of positions and players because i'm like well, there's not, it doesn't really feel like there's that one guy that you're just like, oh, well, he's so much worse than everyone. Like, these are the guaranteeds at the bottom. These four are so much worse than the rest of the league. There's not a lot of positions where you can do that anymore and, and feel really comfortable about it. I feel like, you know, even when we were talking about mid lane, right? And you're talking about the top three, but then, okay, outside of those top three teams, there's still lots of great mid laners and it gets harder and harder. I think as it's been getting more and more competitive for these spots. And honestly, as more talented imports have come into the league. I think it's almost inarguable what 
Zabatine tweeted about, like this split, Rogue, two and sixteen. Last split, H two K, two and sixteen. It feels pretty frequently in the European uh scene that like one of the teams is straight booty and it's almost free wins for every Usually team two to four i'd even argue there's a couple sometimes yeah. and it was it was even worse when they had their two conference system they had two teams at the bottom of each of the conferences that were only beating each other right so i, I think it's something that is worth noting that like I, yeah europe better better international teams i don't think that's arguable either but mm -hmm. in the same way i think their their bottom tier teams are someone are like just punching bags that inflate people's stats so their middle tier and things look a little bit better but i actually do think it's pretty close and i would love to do inverse rift rivals sometime <laughs> i think that would be super fun uh I, I will have to come up with like special branding and a special name for it, but rift failures. <laughs> no, uh, it's not a selling point. If people I, I, watched the cooldown where we had Darshan, uh, <laughs> where we had Darshan singing, yeah, it was a pretty catchy tune. The yeah. La Casa de Fiesta, yeah. Yeah. yeah, something along that lines would be a super fun. If everyone's embracing it, it's yeah. we're casting it that way. The teams are enjoying it that way. I think that type of thing. Where teams are really enjoying getting <laughs> flamed for being the worst from their region and being forced to come. And get Monkey beat. knife fight. But <laughs> if it's if it's positioned as all right, this is the time to bring out all your wacky stuff. Yeah. You know, you who've been talking about your uh, Heimerdinger jungle all split long. I mean, I'm not. I'm, see it. I'm buying it, but I don't think the players. Are no, the, it. the players would not enjoy it. All right, guys, you're gonna dress up in monkey costumes <laughs> and you're gonna pick the dumbest stuff you can imagine. I don't want them to pick dumb stuff. I want it to be competitive. I, I want to see Excel or a rogue versus a. Um, you have to pick your highest win rate in solo queue. Okay. <laughs> no, I want to see regular drafts, Excel, rogue, okay. and misfits versus. Ooh, misfits is actually not that bad. Shoot. Well, I mean, oh, yeah. Misfits yeah. was the story this year of the super team that got put together and crashed. To be fair, I feel like but even their crash, probably lose to everyone right now. Yeah, yeah. They, 100 Thieves is a super team crash. Went 4 and 14, and they went 8 and 10. Like, yeah. I'll take Misfits, please. Yeah. Um, all right, we'll set Get that us out of here. We'll set that up, guys, because okay. that is going to do it for this episode of The Dive. Quarterfinal start this weekend with FlyQuest versus Golden Guardians this Saturday, followed by TSM versus Echo Fox on Sunday. I am excited to get these playoffs started and head on our way to St. Louis so we can figure out who's going to represent us at MSI in our international competition. Fingers crossed this time around. We could do it. I'm sure that we can. Uh, thanks for tuning in and see you next week.